Welcome to Advanced Compound Chemistry and my second lecture on electronic properties of molecules. In this lecture I want to talk about frequency dependent properties or time dependent properties and more specifically about frequency dependent or dynamic polarizabilities. Let's consider now the case where we have an electric field which is not a static electric field as we had considered in my last lecture, but it's the electric field from electromagnetic radiation, for example, light. Uh, this electromagnetic field, of course, changes with time. And one way to express that is here with this cosinus uh, of the frequency times time. Now, an electromagnetic wave, of course, moves through space. So, in principle, there should be also some uh, dependent on the position in space, here in this expression for the electric field of electromagnetic radiation. But uh, I'm going to make here what is called the dipole approximation or the long wavelength approximation, which means that the, for the very small dimension of a molecule, the electric field is constant over the extent of the molecule. And that's a good approximation as long as the wavelengths we are looking at are larger than the standard extent of a molecule. Now, if we're dealing with a time-dependent electric field, then of course the uh, dipole moment of the molecule, when we expose the molecule to this electromagnetic radiation, also will become time-dependent. And we have to generalize our expansion of the dipole moment in a permanent dipole moment and an induced dipole moment, which we had in the lec last lecture, to the case of this uh, time-dependent electric field, which is done in this expression here. So here we have again a component of the permanent dipole moment, whereas all this here is now uh, the component of the induced dipole moment. And therefore here we have now, uh, like we had before, we have a sum over the three components of the electric field, x, y, and z. And we have a polarizability multiplied now with a field uh, where I've in inserted the expression for, for the time-dependent field here. And I assume that uh, the radiation not only consists of um, radiation of one frequency, but several frequency, in order to cover that, I just integrate over all the frequencies here. Now, oh, in order to get an expression for this frequency dependent or what is also called dynamic polarizability, one would have to do basically the same as we quickly did in the, in the last lecture for the static case. One would have to use perturbation theory to derive expressions for the dipole moment independent of electric field and then identify from these expressions uh, a term which does not depend on the field, which will give us back the expression for the permanent dipole moment, and then uh, all the terms which are linear in the field, from which we then can extract what the polarizability is. Now, the difference to the case in, in the last lecture is that now we have a time-dependent perturbation, we have a time-dependent field, so we have the time-dependent perturbation, the perturbation operator actually looks the same, except that now the field is, is time-dependent. But that means we have to use time-dependent perturbation theory. And I won't do that here in this lecture. For that, uh, you have to come to our advanced course, uh, compute, uh, Computation Chemistry. The result is the following. So here we have, again, our uh, component of the now time-dependent uh, dipole moment. And this is, of course, calculated as the expectation value of the corresponding component of the dipole moment operator with the time-dependent wave function, the wave function in the presence of this time-dependent electric field. And it's basically this time-dependent wave function which we have to expand using time-dependent perturbation theory or response theory, as, as one calls it also. And what we get, we get back our... Uh, expectation value with the unperturbed wave function, which is just the alpha component of the permanent dipole moment. And then we get a term which is linear in the electric field. But now, of course, linear in the electric field, and we have still the time dependence here, and we still integrate over all the frequencies. And in front of that, we get something which we can then identify 
as the a component of the frequency dependent polarizability. Now this quantity what we get here is uh, appears in for many other properties as well and it's called a linear response function or sometimes also a polarization propagator but it's a linear response function because it describes and it depends on two operators which in our case here for the polarizability are two dipole moment operators and this dipole moment operator actually is the operator the same not only the same dipole moment operator but it corresponds to this one because that's the operator uh, from here so that's the operator which expectation value we are looking at and the second dipole moment operator that comes from the interaction with the electric field so the linear response function describes how what is the change in the expectation value of this operator by an interaction which is uh, transmitted by this operator here and one can formulate many other response functions with other pairs of operators which sort of describe corresponding properties and the reason why it's called linear is because it appears in the contribution which is linear in the electric field and also because it only sort of has one uh, perturbation operator here now if we assume that we know the exact eigenstates of the unperturbed uh, Hamiltonian this uh, complete set of states psi n uh, zeroth order then one can derive uh, a sum of state expression for this frequency dependent polarizabilities and if you compare that with the ex expression for the polarizability from normal time independent perturbation theory in the last lecture it looks very much the same the only difference is that now here in the denominator we have the frequency of the radiation in there and instead of a 2 in front of the summation we have now two explicit terms one with plus h bar times the frequency and here one with minus h bar with the frequency so here's the frequency dependence uh, from the frequency of the electromagnetic radiation this expression is not the expression which we normally use to calculate uh, frequency dependent polarizabilities in the case of uh, approximate wave functions um, i'll talk about that in, in a few minutes but uh, it's a very useful expression to understand the the content of the frequency dependent polarizability and let's look at the denominator here as we already discussed for the static uh, polarizability this difference here is actually the excitation energy or it's minus the excitation here because that's the energy of an excited state and that's the energy of a ground state and we sum here over all excited states so so this is minus the excitation energy and this is h bar times the uh, frequency of the uh, radiation so that's the energy of the photons so what we have here we have the energy of uh, the incoming photons minus the excitation energy now if the energy of these incoming photons corresponds exactly to an excitation energy then because this is minus the excitation energy we'll get zero here in the denominator which means that uh, the frequency dependent polarizability is going to have a pole or a singularity now we can use that because that means that whenever the frequency dependent polarizability uh, for, for the frequencies for which the frequency dependent polarizability has a singularity or pole we know that this frequency actually corresponds to an excitation energy so this is a way how to find uh, the excitation energies and therefore the energies of the excited states we just tune through the frequency like an old uh, like in a radio and whenever we see a, a, a pole or singularity we know okay now we hit an excitation energy but how do we calculate polarizabilities with approximate wave function because this expression was derived and assuming that we know the exact uh, wave function for all the states in the system which of course we know we never will be able to do it involves approximating the excitation energies by some mean value of the excitation energy and then uh, it becomes independent of n and 
you sort of can remove the summation over the ends here. This is not what is done nowadays anymore. This is really out sum over states expression here, where we had a sum over uh, states and we had um, divided these uh, transition dipole moments uh, with an energy difference, difference between the frequency and the excitation energies. Um, two terms, one with plus h bar omega, one with minus h bar omega. So in the approximate case, well, if you look in some of the older textbooks, uh, there's mentioned uh, uh, approach which is called closure, which sent it. Um, there are two ways of doing that. If you have static polarizabilities, then uh, for most methods, we calculate the static polarizability just of the, as the second derivative of the energy. And uh, there are, of course, two ways you can do that. Either you can actually, in a program, add uh, an electric field of a uh, particular strength, which you have to give in the input. And then you can calculate energies uh, at the different field strengths, and then you could take a numerical derivative. That's called the finite field approach. Uh, but in most programs, um, there's actually these derivatives implemented so that you only have to ask uh, uh, with a keyword for the polarizability. And then, um, the program calculates this as um, second derivatives of the energy, and that could be Hart Fock energy, DFT energy, Carbon cluster energy, or a Müller Blessed perturbation theory energy. Now, in the case of dynamic polarizabilities, we have to calculate uh, this response function, and at several levels of theory, um, expression for the linear response function have been derived Hart Fock, Quan Charm DFT, CI, MCS, DEF. Merleau Blessed perturbation theory um, and cover cluster theory. So, so you can ask for, for the calculation of frequency dependent polarizabilities at different values of frequencies. To this, here we get is where we have we also have. Now, here I want to show the expression for uh, such a linear response function in the simple case of time dependent Hart Fock theory. Time dependent Hart Fock theory, which is uh, also called Hart Fock linear response theory, which is uh, starting doing the derivation of the response function starting with Hart Fock wave function. And a bit similar, in some way, a similar expression because we have something which reminds us of uh, the transition dipole moments here and there, so twice, and we divide again, but we divide now with a matrix. So we have an inverse matrix in the middle standing. Um, in, in, in this inverse matrix, we have here the uh, frequencies of the incoming radiation again, and here with plus and here with minus. So like in, in this two parts of this inverse matrix, one with plus h bar omega and one is minus h bar omega. Right, and there are two matrices, A and B matrices. And this A matrix here we have seen before. It is very closely related to the uh, CI single matrix, meaning the matrix of the Hamiltonian with single excited determinants in the pra and in the cat. So this actually here is, is that single single part of the uh, Hamiltonian matrix. And the only difference to, to that uh, CI singles matrix is that now we subtract, subtract from the diagonal here the Hartle Fock energy. So it's actually the difference between these um, CI singles matrices and the Hart Fock energy. And if we evaluate uh, both these matrix elements, well, the Hart Fock energy, of course, we know how that looks like, we get this expression. So we get uh, an orbital energy difference on the diagonal that makes that it's on the diagonal matrix, and then we get uh, some integrals. There's also a second matrix, which is called the B matrix. And as you can see, this is just, uh, again, a uh, part which we already had in the configuration interaction Hamiltonian matrix. This is the part from the Hart Fock to double excited uh, uh, determinants. And we can use the slater corner rules to evaluate what that gives. So what tells us uh, this, what the contents of these matrices about this time-dependent Hart Fock method. Well, actually, it tells us that the excited states in this time-dependent Hart Fock method 
they are actually uh, approximated by a linear combination of single excited determinants. So the excited states are really described like in this CI singles. Whereas this B matrix here, you can see there we have double excited determinants. The B matrix actually tells us that, however, the ground state in this method is not just the Hart de Fock wave function, but it's the Hart de Fock wave function where we have mixed in double excited double excited determinants. So we have included some correlation uh, in this crowd state. Now most of you will probably never perform a time-dependent hard fog calculation, but very likely time-dependent DFT calculations. And uh, the linear response function in time-dependent DFT actually has the same form as this one, exactly the same form. Uh, the only difference come in in the explicit expression for the A and B matrices, because of course in the uh, DFT method, in the Concharm Fock operator, you have normally not the exchange operator from Hart to Fock, if you're not using some hybrid functional, uh, but you have the same cool operator. So the, the differences between time dependent and time dependent Hart to Fock and time dependent DFT is actually in these two integrals here. Uh, where the exchange type integral is probably not going to be there, at least not if you're not using a, a hybrid function. In addition, we will get, you will get some integrals which come from the precise form of whatever exchange correlation function you're using. But otherwise, the expressions are the same. I want to conclude my lectures on uh, frequency dependent polarizabilities with mentioning where you actually uh, uh, can see it and see in the real meaning of that word, because the frequency dependent polarizability is the molecular property behind the refractive index. Here we have the refractive index, which depends obviously on the uh, frequency of the radiation, and that leads to this dispersion of light. It leads to the fact that uh, we see a rainbow, because this is, this is the the fact that the refractive index of water depends on the frequencies. Um, and for simple nonpolar molecules, uh, one can calculate the, or the expression for the refractive index is given here, and one can exp um, approximate this uh, square root in this uh, slightly simpler form, where this is the frequency dependent polarizability. And that's the number density of the molecules, because I mean the refractive index is a property, a macroscopic property and the frequency dependent polarizability is a microscopic uh, property. So whenever you sort of see this person, whenever you ever see a rainbow, you should uh, think about that what you're seeing is actually the frequency dependence of a polarizability.